habit of saying a very, very warm welcome to an extraordinarily warm uh, top floor of the Centre for Catholic Formation in Tooting Bay. It is an absolute pleasure to have you here tonight. An absolute pleasure to have so many uh, friends and uh, future friends, new friends, uh, with us tonight. My name is Mark Nash. I'm the director of the, uh, the Centre for Catholic Formation, otherwise known as the uh, CCF. And this year we're celebrating a very special uh, anniversary. We're celebrating our 50th anniversary, our golden jubilee. Um, so you are with us on this occasion. And what better uh, sort of way uh, to spend uh, an anniversary than with uh, with friends? Uh, and and uh, uh, yes, as I say, with friends and with future friends. Um, tonight's talk um, has obviously stirred a tremendous amount of interest. Uh, we've had two talks in our lecture series, one on the priority of adult formation and the other one on the catechetical journey, the, sort of the history of catechesis over the last 50 years. We'll be having another talk on the 19th of June on disability theology, which has um, been a, a, a massive linchpin of this centre's work over the last 50 years. Uh, but tonight it's an absolute pleasure uh, to go away from the particular work of the centre with adult formation, catechesis and evangelisation. Well, perhaps not evangelization, as we'll hear later. Um, to talk about uh, G.K. Chesterton. Um, so, just a couple of housekeeping notices. Um, if you do require the facilities, they're on the, uh, the, the back stairs, um, most readily available. Hopefully, you've been sufficiently, uh, um, how to say, it, lubricated next door. You've had your sort of uh, well, uh, well, um, well entertained. Let's put it that way. Um, if there is a fire alarm and there isn't one planned, then we'll all gather uh, towards the marquee at the far end of the garden. Um, just this film, this is also being filmed for um, YouTube. The Centre for Catholic Formation has a YouTube channel, relatively recent edition, and we're inviting people to subscribe to that. <coughs> so this video will feature on our YouTube channel uh, once it's gone through the, the sort of the editing process. You can have some input into that, can John, if you wish. Um, and it will also be live streamed on Facebook. Now, none of your faces will be visible in either of these, uh, but if you don't mind, if there are no objections, I'd love to take a photo of you all, uh, perhaps at the end of the evening. And if you do object, just hide behind somebody else. <laughs> so, many of you know our speaker tonight, um, Canon John Ugris, spiritual director at St Mary's uh, uh, College, Oxford, uh, the Darson Seminary from the north of England. Um, he uh, is also a, a, sort of a, a renowned uh, sort of retreat giver, uh, lecturer in homiletics. Um, but in 2013, some five years ago, Canon John was given the responsibility by his diocesan bishop um, to uh, sort of investigate the cause uh, of, of tonight's, uh, tonight's theme, tonight's personage. Um, so without further ado, you don't want to hear me, you want to hear Canon John Eucharist. such a joy to be uh, sharing uh, Chesterton with you and hopefully delighting with you in his abiding influence um, on this, the 82nd anniversary of his death. So 14th of June uh, 1936 was when he was uh, called to the Lord and uh, indeed uh, on my way down this morning uh, from Birmingham I uh, was making good time so I popped into uh, the uh, cemetery in, in Beaconsfield, uh, Shepherd's Lane Cemetery, and uh, put some flowers there on, on G.K.'s grave and uh, um, said a prayer for him, on, uh, uh, to him, on his, uh, on his anniversary. And, um, I have to say, um, there's, during the course of the day, been a uh, a little anniversary gift, you might say, um, and that's something I'm going to uh, share with you at the very end, just to keep you waiting for what that might be. Uh, but just to say, uh, I'm, I was thrilled when, when it, it came through um, uh, earlier uh, on, on my email. Um, so, um, as I say, what I want to do is to focus this evening on Chesterton's influence on those in his lifetime, first of all, and probably actually the biggest chunk of what I'm going to share with you is, is, is that. But then his abiding influence uh, around the world today, all by way of inviting you to reflect upon and maybe share with me, uh, if you care to, 
um, his influence on you, his influence in your life. And right away, let me say, uh, that although my investigation is, is coming to an end, and I hope to have that into the bishop um, by the end of July, um, I'm really <coughs> hoping that, that, that this last you know, uh, few weeks, I'm going to be inundated with a lot, of, a lot more emails just um, sharing with me what Chesterton means to you. You may have seen uh, in the uh, past week, in fact, a few weeks, a flurry of interest in the media um, who've uh, got wind that this uh, investigation is now uh, nearing its end. Um, and, of course, it's going to be then Bishop Peter's uh, place, position, gift to make a decision one way or another as to whether or not to open Chesterton's cause, so that's the first thing I need to say is the cause is not open, despite what you might read, some of the nothing press. Um, um, and he will do that and make that decision, obviously after consulting with um, the Bishops' Conference here in England and Wales and the Congregation for the Causes of Saints uh, over in Rome. But this evening what I want to do is to share a little of, of what I've discovered in my research for example, about whether people considered Chesterton holy in his lifetime, uh, and particularly what they said around the time of his death. And then I'll review the present situation around the world uh, with regard to his cult. Uh, that is to say where, where people are with regard, regard to uh, not just their admiration of him, but their devotion to him. But I want to frame this uh, reflection this evening within the portrait of holiness recently painted for us by um, Pope Francis in his apostolic exhortation on that subject, Gaudete et Exhortate, in which he begins by saying, holiness is the most attractive face and that we are all called to, to be saints in the concrete circumstances of our ordinary lives and not, quote, to settle for a bland and mediocre existence. So I want to say at the outset that there's something about Chesterton, something about his writing and his beautiful personality that shines through that writing that is fundamentally attractive. that there was certainly nothing bland about Chesterton or mediocre. He often uh, spoke about the spices of life. And he had the blessed ability to, uh, to bring out, to add spice, as it were, uh, to, to, to life, to bring out the full flavor of the glory of existence. An obituary that appeared in the uh, Southern Daily Echo four days after his death puts it like this. We lived more abundantly for having met Chesterton. And I think that was the secret of his influence. He certainly spiced up, um, he certainly spiced up my life. And uh, if you're still in any doubt, I promise, you, he can spice up yours too. And maybe this evening might be a spur to you putting uh, you on the road to just that, to experiencing that, to meeting him, um, and to be able to say as one of uh, his friends did um, after his death, it was my benediction to know him. But before we get properly into our subject, did you um, know that in the liturgical calendar of the Episcopal Episcopalian Church in the States, they already commemorate him. And actually they keep his memory on the 13th of June. So yesterday, and because we have to think about Basil the Great, I think is celebrated today in their calendar. And they identify the specific charism, obviously they don't call him a saint, but it's down there in the calendar as G.K. Chesterton, apologist and writer, identifying in that way the specific charism uh, listed, uh, or, or the, the specific profile of his 
of his, uh, uh, his holiness and his impact on others. If any of you have uh, seen the recent DVD series by Bishop Robert Barron called Pivotal Players, about figures whom he considers as having a pivotal influence in the church, you will know that Chesterton is one of them alongside uh, John Henry Newman. And I notice that the title he gives to the episode on Newman is The Convert, and the title he gives to the episode on Chesterton is The Evangelist. And I think that title is well chosen. Indeed, one of the latest books on Chesterton that I'm reading at the moment is entitled, intriguingly, The Scrappy Evangelist, meaning as in um, uh, the evangelist who, who liked to have a scrap, to, to have a fight. I remember being very struck when reading the notebooks that Chesterton wrote as a student of art. Um, I remember being struck some, by so many doodles in those pages, um, little sketches which I think are very revealing because many of them are swords of different shapes and sizes already there in his early years. I think he felt kind of cold in a way to, 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 to fight. Um, he fought, of course, with his mind and, and with his words. I was rereading the other evening um, the letter he wrote to his mother on the day of his reception into the Catholic Church. And, and knowing how that news uh, would hurt her, he explains how he sees that step, step as something in continuity with all the ideals that she and um, his father handed on to him. And that becoming a Catholic was, in that letter he says, a new and necessary form of fighting. For those very values that she, she, she initially taught him. And he saw uh, becoming a Catholic as joining what he said was the one fighting form of Christianity for the church militant. So I want to say from the outset the impact of Chesterton's holiness is felt through the fighting that was his writing. Moreover, that that's how he himself became holy. And that's something that Pope Francis is saying in that uh, exhortation that we become holy not by withdrawing from everyday activity, but by immersing ourselves in that, engaging um, with that in ever more, uh, ever more generous. Chesterton's holiness lay in his life as, he liked to point out, a jolly journalist. His trade, which he re regarded as all about the truth, um, was of the way that he became holy and the way he helped others to become holy too. And he shows us in that way that faith and Fleet Street are not mutually exclusive. And that literally sanctity comes in different shapes and sizes. And this is one of the reasons I think it would be timely to introduce his course because he will break undoubtedly with his great colleague the traditional mould of those we have up to now considered saints. Listen to him here, and I shall att attempt uh, an impersonation of him. <laughs> Not very good at impersonations. You <laughs> might get the idea of how, how he spoke. Actually, he spoke in a higher pitched voice than I have. Appealing, as one uh, commentator has put it. And he was always teasing. Uh, trying to make you laugh, or at least smile. So here we are, here, here's Chesterton <laughs> describing how we've kind of had a too narrow a, an idea of saints up to now. We dimly connect being good with being delicate and even dapper, <laughs> with not being grotesque or loud or violent. Now, it is always a pleasure to be loud and violent, and sometimes it is a duty. A man can be loudly and violently virtuous. Nay, he can be loudly and violently saintly. 
though that is not the type of saintliness we usually recognize. But, I would say, we may well be on the verge of that in this case. Um, though the mind boggles with the thought of the size of the statues that might have <laughs> So with that as an introduction, let me begin to consider if, indeed, Ch Chesterton was considered saintly in his own lifetime. Shortly after his death, William Titterton published the very first biography of Chesterton. It's a very short one, kind of almost written like in the, with a gush of gratitude after, after Chesterton's death. Now, he was cont contemporary, obviously, of Chesterton's and a close collaborator. He was the uh, sub-editor of Chesterton's own uh, newspaper, GK's Weekly, and he in fact became a Catholic um, himself under GK's influence. And in that book he writes of how saints are aware of God at all times, and then he admits, quote, It is not for me to say Gilbert Chesterton attains such continued awareness of God, though I trust it is permitted to me to hope that this will someday be Later on in the book, he becomes more explicit. I will admit that I have strong hopes that it will one day be acknowledged that G.K.C. died a saint. Though they are, there are fewer saints known on earth than in the courts of heaven. And then in the penultimate paragraph of that biography, he speaks of Chesterton in the present tense. Notice just I acknowledging that the experience of his influence is now being, as it were, from that great cloud of witnesses that Letter to the Hebrew speaks about, cheering us on from that grandstand, and um, the rest of us who are still involved in that race. So here's that penultimate paragraph. He is with us still. He is nearer to us than he has been the last years. Ill health made him a little remote from us, but now he's back again as strong and as jolly as ever. And the spirit that was um, always the spirit of a giant has now become the spirit of ten, the strength of ten. He marches with us. He leads us. He is ours. And this is not a manner of speaking, a sentimental folly. It is a fact as hard as steel. Among the uh, many periodicals for which Chesterton uh, wrote was the Illustrated London News. In fact, this is the edition um, that was uh, published um, immediately after Chesterton's death. But in an edition a little bit later that year, in fact, the October the 31st Halloween edition, um, the, the successor to his slot, as it were, in the illustrated in London News, uh, Arthur Bryant, um, wrote all about the feasts that we keep around those days. And here's what he says. It's quite a long quote, quote but I think it's a, it's a useful one. There are many whose names appear on no Christian calendar, who by struggle and endeavour and conquest earned their right to be included among the saintly company. Of such was that very wise and good man who for 31 years prior to this summer contributed to this column, Gilbert Keith Chesterton. He spent his whole life in teaching others how to live. The very sound of his name is like a trumpet call. To him the world was like a strenuous field in which one went about doing battle with evil in order that good might endure. If from, this, from his generation one had to select one man who might have stood as a type of Don Quixote or St. George who slew the dragon, it was he. If any literary name of our age becomes a legend, it will be his. He was the kind of man who Bunyan, of whom Bunyan was thinking when he drew the picture of Mr. Greatheart, the sword defending the uh, pilgrims. His sword was at the service of pilgrims, and what a sword it was. His Catholicism was an all-comprehending democracy, I never met a more generous man, and I never saw a happier. And I do not believe there is anyone who has, who had the inestimable privilege to know G GKC who would not say the same. It is right that he should be remembered on the day set apart 
for the recollection of the saints of God. I love the um, mention there of the great heart and also of St. George, and it reminds me of something else Chesterton wrote. In every romance, there must be three characters. There must be the princess, who is a thing to be loved. There must be the dragon, who is a thing to be fought. And there must be St. George, who is a thing that both loves and fights. Mm. Here, Chesterton is lamenting the fact that people usually opt for one or the other, fighting or loving, while failing to see that they both imply each other. And the nub of his argument, you cannot love a thing without wanting to fight for it. And you cannot fight without something to fight for. As we've already said, Chesterton loved a good fight. In fact, fighting was his whole life. But never, ever in hatred, always in love. He was someone who fought valiantly because he loved valiantly. Believing that, uh, as he said elsewhere, the true soldier fights not because he hates what is in front of him, but because he loves what is behind him. Another character and contemporary of G.K.'s was the Dominican Father Vincent McNabb, someone who Chester himself felt was the nearest thing to a saint he'd come across. And in his obituary of G.K., he continues this combat, combative uh, imagery. This is McNabb. <coughs> this man who was a child at self-defense was a dragon slayer in defense of others. He goes on his description of uh, GK's uh, impact, uh, which is, by the way, well worth reading in its entirety. He says, now we come to the most delicate and therefore deliberate thing we have to say about the man Gilbert Chesterton. While not using the word sanctity as synonymous with that verifiable heroic virtue which receives official authentication, <coughs> We cannot complete what we feel should be said about him without using the word sanctity or holiness. Holiness, at least in the English form, denotes a certain wholeness which the rounded and complete life of Chesterton suggests to our thought. It sums up, he was a born philosopher, a born poet, a born knight, and I will make bold to say, a reborn saint. Reading through the many letters of uh, Francis uh, Chest uh, um, Chesterton um, that she received on the death of her husband is very revealing in terms of the very personal uh, influence he exer exer exerted on um, people all around the world. And I want to turn now to some of what, for me, were the highlights of reading those letters in the British Library. The very first one was a May ba Bakewell written on the very day of of uh, uh, Chesterton's death, as indeed were many of those letters. Um, so people were moved immediately to write. In it she describes being honoured by his friendship, which she says made one feel one's best. And this is something that's repeated um, in so many of these letters. And it reminds me actually of something um, his brother Cecil's wife wrote about him. There are so many small people, small that is to say in the sense that they have no public life, who owe a great deal to his marvellous capacity for bringing out the best in them. His greatness never overshadowed the individual, individuality of anyone, but was rather the kindly warmth that draws from hidden sources a sudden burgeoning of confidence. And it makes me think of Chesterton uh, describing in uh, his biography of Charles Dickens. There is a great man who makes every man feel small, but the real great man is the man who makes every man feel great. I think G.K. himself was proof of the truth of this. May Bell Bakewell signs off her letter to Francis with a sentiment that betrays um, in whose company she is assured he already finds himself. She says, may God give you his peace, which he has already granted to his saints who have done their work here. A letter from Joe, uh, Joe, Joe Lamplew in Birmingham provides another beautiful image of how so many felt indebted to him. She writes, it's foolish for me to try to tell you how much I owe to him. 
because it was he who first showed me the path which led me into the church. He must have been a godfather in similar ways to many hundreds, perhaps thousands of people. And those of us who were privileged to meet him found him even greater as a man than as a writer. I felt I was a real godchild of his, and I feel a real sense of loss and of joy at having a godfather in heaven. I love that image of G.K. as a godfather, but also that, 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 that um, what she says there about being in, even more um, moved by Chesterton as a man than as a writer. It reminds me of something that Ronnie Knox said at, at um, the panegyric uh, at uh, G.K.'s uh, Thanksgiving Mass in Westminster Cathedral, and he ends up by talking about Chesterton's humility, and he says that more than anything he wrote about humility, he knew what he did. One cleric from the States wrote, wrote this prophecy, his tomb will be a sacred shrine and the goal of many an American. And that certainly proved true. Uh, when I was parish priest at Beaconsfield, uh, between 96 and 2003, it was largely pilgrims from the States and from Latin America too who would periodically call at the presbytery door for directions to his grave. Which is underlined for me in those years that the lack of local cult that there was. But that's been changing in, uh, in recent years and uh, Stuart sitting in there has uh, coordinated the, uh, for the past the seven years, Stuart, the um, walking pilgrimage from, uh, from uh, Kensington uh, to 30 miles or so to, to, to Beaconsfield, and I believe it's happening again uh, uh, this year, at the end of July. Is it on the Saturday? Yeah, Saturday, the 28th of July. 20th. 28th. 28th. It's Saturday. So this is the Saturday nearest uh, to uh, the anniversary of Chesterton's being received into the church, which was the 30th of July. So that you know, I would say that there's a sign in these recent years that that, that uh, local cult is, is, is indeed growing. Some of these letters um, already hint at parallels with Newman. And it's interesting that, for example, in the Telegraph this week, um, uh, you may have seen that, that, uh, that one article speaks about Chesterton's potentially the first English man to be de declared a saint since the martyrs, of which he was so fond of especially Thomas More. But of course we all know that Newman almost, most, almost certainly beat him uh, to that. But here are a couple of extracts from those letters to Francis that, that parallel her husband to, to, to with him. One Arthur Stewart wrote, I think that in years to come his insight and profound wisdom will be better appreciated than they are now. Englishmen, and especially English Catholics, will look back to him somewhat as they look back now to Newman. Then, uh, um, a seminary professor, uh, Father John Fenland from Baltimore, uh, wrote, I have considered him the deepest and wisest of our writers since Cardinal Newman. I know no other writer who has so consistently held his head in the air and yet kept his feet on the ground. <laughs> There are certain, uh, certainly obvious parallels with Newman, both great thinkers who became great converts and who drew with them, uh, through their influence, many others into the Catholic fold. But as I pointed out um, to many who mentioned precisely this, that with regard to Chesterton's influence in becoming Catholics, admiration is one thing, devotion is another. I mean, it's one thing to acknowledge an intellectual and even spiritual debt to Chesterton, but quite another to experience that debt as a personal bond and even a living relationship in the communion of saints. And further, to express that bond in prayer and in the seeking of his intercession. But before we come on to those present day testimonies, two last ones um, from uh, uh, those writing to Francis after uh, G.K.'s death. For the first from um, R. N. Greer Armitage in Bath, who writes, So much of my mental makeup has been actually derived from him. 
I suppose his perfect poise and complete humility made it hard for him to realize the vast influence he exercised. But it was very real, and I'm sure his wisdom, his wit, his profundity, and his goodness will be quarried increasingly in the years to come. That he was also a saint, I am entirely, entirely convinced. And I'm pretty sure you could confirm my faith in, in, in that respect. It was one of the great privileges of my life to have known him and to have come under his glorious influence. Lastly, let's hear from Maisie Ward, who wrote, as you may know, the first substantial biographies on Chesterton, which still remain a reference point um, for the many others that have been uh, uh, written since. She wrote to Francis, again, if I remember rightly, on the very day of uh, his death, saying this. That he was the greatest man of his age is to me simply indisputable, and it will be realized more and more. And she says, I have begun to pray to him already. So let's turn now to some of the many uh, testimonies I've been receiving from around the world. Um, many of them from those who've been received into the Catholic Church and have experienced uh, Chesterton's personal accompaniment in that. Very many citing his book, Orthodoxy, as critical in that accompaniment. But as I was saying earlier, intellectual admiration then influences one thing, and devotion that experiences that influence as a, relig a living relationship is quite another. One of those letters I've just been citing re refers to Chesterton mellowing the furniture on which he sat. <laughs> mellowing the furniture on which he sat. And so many of the emails I've been receiving over the past five years are from people who've experienced the mellowing effect he's had on their minds and their hearts. So let's listen to a few of them. Here's something from a PhD student in the States who came across Chesterton for the first time in his teens. It's important to be clear about what Chesterton meant and means to me. It is not just that he was a good writer or author or even a great personality. For me, he was more like a window, a window to a larger world and to God. It was through him that I came to see and know the world, the church, and God as they really are. Holiness is hard to define, but surely this is a good definition of holiness, to be an open window through which God and his light and his grace can come to the soul. This was what Chesterton was and is for me. As a teenager, I started praying for Chesterton's intercession. And on many occasions, I have received small graces through his help. But his presence as an intercessor has been expressed far more in a sense of constant presence and sustenance, especially in the darkest and most difficult times of my life. I turn to him quite naturally on a daily basis for help and grace, and he is still a constant companion to me, a constant source of support and guidance. Chesterton's influence is uh, largely, uh, is felt uh, very strongly in uh, Latin America where he's still widely read. I think that's largely due to the um, uh, Argentinian author, um, Borges, who translated Chesterton into Spanish. Interestingly, um, this author loved G.K. for what he called the childlike and divine happiness that pervades his books, died 50 years to the day of his beloved hero. In fact, the earliest formal um, requests for uh, Chesterton's cause to be open, I've tracked back to more than 30 years ago now, and guess where? Argentina. Mm. Where, I believe, is a thriving Chesterton society, and um, uh, I believe they uh, um, hold conferences, um, which the then Cardinal Bergoglio would uh, frequently attend. And indeed, before becoming Pope, he approved a prayer to be prayed, not exactly for uh, Chesterton's canonization um, or invoking explicitly his intercession, but for his work and message to be more widely. Anyway, let's hear from a teacher in Mexico 
who again got to know Chesterton in her teens. As I grew up, I had many gloomy days tainted with the depression and with the temptation of thinking that God didn't love me. Chesterton became my antidote to each of these spells. I can't but uh, be reminded of something he said about saints. A saint is medicine because it is an antidote. She said, I wanted to be closer to Chesterton's God, the one who was never tired of making each and every daisy, the one who hid his everlasting joy. When I had any doubts about my faith, reading Chesterton always helped me to see my problems with a new light, to smile, to continue with my life. Today, um, I'm 50 years old, and it always amazes me the difference it makes in the lives of young people to, uh, I, uh, uh, to teach Chesterton. I know that Chesterton's writings have something special that points to truth, love, and gratitude. Chesterton helped me a lot with my life and with my relationship with God. I hope that one day... And then, I think maybe, maybe just finally, I received um, um, an email from a young Croatian man after a conference held there in uh, Zagreb last month. Um, and I know there's at least one person here attended that, so we might hear about it a little bit uh, later. And I believe that as part of that weekend, uh, there was a mass uh, held that was specifically offered for Chesterton's celebrated, I think, by the uh, Jesuit superior in that country. But here's what that young man has to say about his personal experience of Chesterton's uh, spiritual accompaniment. Chesterton is really popular among the Croatian youth. It's also worth noting that our club members are all young people of different backgrounds, theologians, engineers, architects, students, <laughs> lawyers. The average age is 25. I myself am 30 years old. When I was translating, calling the meetings, reading Chesterton and so on, I felt some kind of fire. I felt that I was burning with ideas, with light, with a feeling that we must do something. It all helped me out of the um, low spirits and form of a kind of depression I was feeling. I also had this urge, this need to pray to Chesterton. I finally had a feeling that I have a friend who is someone who is looking out for me and is guiding me in my life. In a way, I realized what it means to have a friend. In the testimonies that I continue to receive, and I hope you will, if you feel moved to do so, email me yours too. And um, by the way, positive or negative, um, if you have reservations or even outright you know, um, opposition to that, please, I need to hear from you. Um, and it will all go into, into the report. Um, but one of the interesting things, another interesting thing, has been to know how people are seeking his intercession in, um, in specific areas. So, for example, I remember talking to um, Aidan, Aidan Mackey, almost the last link to those who knew uh, Chesterton directly. And he remembers in the early days of his marriage asking Chesterton to find them their first house, uh, presumably remembering the trip that he and, and uh, Francis made to Beaconsfield in search of theirs. The obvious area of inter intercession is the one we've all already alluded to um, in terms of accompanying those who are making their journey into church. But there are also couples I know who are struggling to see the child who have emailed me to say they are praying to Chesterton and indeed to his wife for this intention, instinctively knowing that because Gilbert and Francis weren't able to have children of their own, they would make appropriate and empathetic intercessors in that regard. But all the testimonies I've referred to above lead me to suggest Chesterton as a powerful prayer warrior in another specific area. This, this, all these testimonies I've just shared with you, as a common denomination, he brought joy into their lives. So here's where I want to begin to bring these reflections to a close. By returning again to the Holy Father's apostolic exhortation, because in it he speaks of the holiness specific to each person, which he calls um, their unique mission and their personal mystery. Here's what 
some, as some of what the Holy Father says in this regard. Each saint is a mission planned by the Father to reflect and embody at a specific moment in history a certain aspect of the Gospel. So, what is the specific aspect of the Gospel, do you think, that Gilbert Keith Chesterton particularly embodied and continues to embody? Or again, from a slightly different angle, the Francis says, Every saint is a message which the Holy Spirit takes from the riches of Jesus Christ and gives to his people. So, what might be the specific message, particular word, which sums up Chesterton's mission? I'd be interested in your answers, and we could come up with many, but I suspect. Earlier today, I led... Uh, Day of recollection for uh, the clergy of the Archdiocese of Southwark, and looking at specifically um, aspects of Chesterton's favourite saint, Francis of Assisi, which attracted uh, um, him, and which attracted him because they were an important part of his own home. So humility, gratitude, and childlikeness, and courtesy. But let me end by suggesting that it is Chesterton's evangelical an infectious joy that might be his particular attraction and gift to the people of our time and indeed the antidote to its ills. You remember that his book, Orthodoxy, ends with a magnificent reflection on what he calls the gigantic joy of the Christian. And how this mirth was something we don't see in the Gospels, but which Chesterton suggests Jesus hid from everyone except his father when he went up into the hills to pray. Now, although Chesterton certainly knew his scriptures, perhaps he didn't know the passage from Luke, which is called the Cry of Jubilation, where Jesus is described as being filled with the joy of the, the Holy Spirit, and exclaiming, I bless you, Father, Lord, heaven and earth, for hiding these mysteries from the learned and the clever, and revealing them to me of joy. For me, it is this joy which is the predominant personal mystery and particular gift to the world of the one I love to call, albeit with a Chestertonian chuckle, the cigar smoking beer loving, blessed Gilbert of Beckinsale. <laughs>
<laughs> Whenever someone suggests that faith is something cramped, crabby, and puritanical, I encourage him to read even one paragraph of Chesterton. For years I've appreciated his love of paradox. I've enjoyed his puns, plays on words, and surprising reversals. I've read many of his books, which each experience like opening a bottle of champagne, intoxicating, sparkling, and rare. Yet, it's not just his style I admire. His effectiveness as an evangelist is what makes him uniquely compelling. His joyous, confident expression of orthodoxy remains an antidote to the prevailing skepticism, materialism, and cynicism of our time. He embodied the new evangelization decades before that movement received its name. I'm convinced G.K. Chesterton is a saint and should be formally recognized as one. I ask for his intercession often. Over the years, I've especially re requested his prayers for the media work of my Word on Fire ministry. Chesterton has a strong following among our Word on Fire staff, and he's been an important friend and touchstone for our movement. But why is now the right time for his cause to move forward? First, I think, because as the world becomes increasingly secular, especially the West, Chesterton offers a healthy engagement with skepticism. He never smeared his opponents, never exchanged fire for fire, never used vulgarity. He loved his intellectual opponents and counted atheists among his closest friends. We've lost the art of charitable religious argument, of speaking tr the truth in love, as St. Paul described it and Chesterton can help us recover it. I don't know anyone who better exemplifies the Evangelium Gaudium, the joy of the gospel, so championed by the Holy Father. The sheer exuberance of his life harkens back to Irenaeus, who said, the glory of God is a human being fully alive. Chesterton was and remains fully alive. At a time when many Christians seem defeated and uninspired, we need his bubbly excitement about the gospel, his verve and excitement to proclaim the uniqueness of Christ. I hope that in my lifetime we will see G.K. Chesterton formally recognized for his heroic virtue. He doesn't need that title, but we need him. I believe he's a saint. I offer my full support for his cause. Peace, Bishop Robert Barron, Auxiliary Bishop of the Archdiocese of Los Angeles. Mm -hmm.